I will I will hand it over to um, Jane and Michelle to uh, to introduce this and, and tell us what you're up to. Great, Th thanks, Andrea. It's it's Jane. Um, I'm going to start just for the first couple of slides, and then I'm going to turn over the bulk of the presentation to Michelle. Andrea, are you changing the slides? Yes. Okay. So we'll just, I'll just, we'll just try to speak to the slide numbers for anyone that's not on, on the WebEx and is watching the slides separately. Um, and as Andrea mentioned, we're going to try to do some polling as well. So there will be opportunities to engage um, and for you to give us some of the feedback. So um, I think we can go to the next slide, Andrea. Okay. Um, just very quickly for those of you who are not familiar with the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, it is essentially a Canada-wide network of partners and collaborators uh, who are dedicated to, to wildlife health and really focused on generating knowledge, uh, the knowledge of the information that's needed to assess and manage wildlife health. Um, the CWHC has been going since 1992 um, and is the, the regional centers are, re are housed and supported by the five vet schools across Canada as well as the British Columbia Animal Health Center. But it is not limited to those veterinary locations. Um, it really is a really broad network of public and um, private um, partners. Since 92, the CWHC has done a lot of sort of traditional wildlife disease surveillance where we rely quite heavily on dead wildlife and targeted studies of specific pathogens, things like avian influenza or West Nile virus. And that type of surveillance is really consistent with sort of basic international expectations. But be, because of climate change and urbanization, growing demand for animal protein, all of these things are kind of pushing wildlife, domestic animals, and humans into closer proximity. Um, and that is really pushing, our, our pushing us to evolve the type of surveillance that we've been doing. Um, because of that change, there's likely going to be exposure to new health and disease risks. Um, the needs of our data users um, are really changing, where traditionally it would have been on sort of diagnostics and why does that wild animal die. Our data is being used much more broadly by um, agriculture, by public health, um, planners, whatever the case might be. So the data is really being used in many different ways. Um, and all of those changes are, are sort of challenging our our ability to do effective health surveillance across all of these different populations. Next slide. And so to meet that challenge, we're, we're trying to really evolve what we consider a traditional disease surveillance platform and shift it into this wildlife health intelligence platform instead. And we're using, there's quite a few models out there. Some of them are like the Global Public Health Information Network, or there's some other networks that are specific to different populations. Um, so it's not necessarily a new thing, but it is a new thing for the CWHC. And, and, I, and I think we, nobody has done this for an extensive, like a long time. And so it is pushing sort of the, the envelope of what surveillance is. And next slide, Andrea. And so to do this transition, we've kind of identified three major areas of focus where we, we want to do better. So one is on managing our data better, and that's somewhat of an internal uh, advancement for the CWHC in terms of our database and how the data are entered and used. Uh, but what we're really wanting to talk to you about today is how we are going to use new and different information sources and to do more with all of the different data that we have um, or will be getting. And so in order to do that, those sort of two activities, um, we have a pilot project that aims to develop an agricultural threat evaluation tool. And that really is the focus of today's presentation and discussion. So with that really brief introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, and she's going to tell us about that pilot project um, and how we would like you to participate. So over to Michelle. Thank you, Jane. OK, so yes, our pilot project is using avian influenza as our model with the additional objective of using it as an agricultural threat evaluation tool. So for each week of our pilot study, our surveillance question is, what's the threat level for AI transmission from wild birds to domestic animals in poultry and BC and Alberta are our, our study sites for this week? And so the goals are to develop new information technology and analyze that data from diverse sources 
And with that tied to improve surveillance to accommodate faster threat detection, and that would be threat detection without necessarily a diagnosis of avian influenza, just the threat of it. And we're hoping that there will be, that will be able to inspire producers and industry to um, move and implement greater biosecurity. We haven't included it necessarily on this project, but there's also the opportunity to use citizen science and have producers uh, generate some data um, as well in the future. So this is an Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada funded project uh, with support from the Chicken Farmers of Canada, Turkey Producers of Canada, Canadian Hatching Eggs, as well as the CFIA and Environment Canada. Next slide, please. So, so this is a, a schematic of our, of our project, uh, and it's, at the top it has the sensors, and health intelligence systems, or health information systems, they're also called. The sensor just means the data source. And the middle box is the indicator-based components, and it combines information from a number of, so the indicator-based components take the routine surveillance of disease, such as dead bird surveillance, like Jane talked about, from CWHC, commercial poultry testing in Canada from CANACE, and, and poultry and wild bird testing elsewhere in the world, and that information is being gathered by CZ. And it's combined with other relevant information, such as the environmental conditions, the box on the left, and, and, and those are the conditions that provide suitable habitat for waterfowl and are also known to increase avian influenza virus survival in the environment. And then the box on the right are the event-based components, so that's information about avian influenza collected from non-traditional the traditional means. So that's reports on ProMed, which we're getting that information from ZZ, and also Twitter accounts on, on um, about avian influenza, we'll be gathering that. So all of that information is gathered from various interfaces and apps and, and pulled together in a data center where it's collected and the next step is to integrate and analyze it. And that's where our proof of concept is stopping, is that is at the integration and analyzing stage. Um, we hope to generate signals which will then be reported to industry boards and regulatory agents, agencies, and from there they can um, mount the response of either preventative measures or control measures. Next slide, please. So this is a map of our study sites. So one is in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia, and the other is Central Alberta from just north of Edmonton to just north of Calgary, so along the number two there. So we want to stress that we are not trying to compare the two sites, and we've selected them uh, because they are very different. So we're trying to evaluate the threat of AI transmission from, commercial, from wild birds to commercial poultry and how that threat changes over time at each of the sites. So each site will be evaluated independently. Next slide, please. So just a review of what's been done so far. In phase one was an inventory of data sources that might be useful. So, so a review of the avian influenza literature, of how, how avian influenza is transmitted from wild birds to domestic birds. And then a consultation with industry. So I interviewed producers, industry members, and regulatory agencies, veterinarians, about what information they would find compelling enough to respond. What do they need to hear in order to change what they're doing? and how is that information best provided. And I also looked at the gray literature on Google to see what other sources of wild bird avian influenza, avian influenza information was available. In phase two, I looked at, you know, we looked at all the information that was available and tried to decide what data was available and what was reliable. And keeping in mind that we're trying to use data that is going to be changing over time. So in the literature, there's lots of information about the importance of the density of poultry farms in an area. But that won't be included in this study because that doesn't change over time. And the, the, next, the next stage as far as data uh, reliability will be looking at its usefulness, and that will continue on to the next end of the project. Next slide, please. So, so the, the categories of data that we are using, there's three categories. One was detection of notifiable avian influenza. So notifiable avian influenza has been defined as any, any AI strain of H5 or H7, both the high and low path. And the data sources from that are CWHC's wild bird surveillance, uh, CZ using their Kiwi platform, and online media, uh, to be scraping or whatever the word is for Twitter. 
The next category is waterfowl migratory routes, and the source of information from that is Ducks Unlimited, uh, their waterfowl migration alert, and eBird, which is a citizen science uh, program for the birding community, and they, and, and they report and access information about birds. The final category are environmental conditions, so we're looking at temperature and rainfall, and that information is coming from the Weather Underground, which uses personal weather stations, thousands of personal weather stations, and as well as Environment Canada. NDVI, which stands for Normalized Density Vegetation Index, which just means how green is it. And that information is coming from re remote sensing using satellites, um, of, and that's from NASA. And then the other one is soil moisture to, as a measure of surface water, and that is coming from RadarSat, which is Canadian Space Agency's uh, satellite-based remote sensing program. Next slide, please. So we have started collecting data, and we're getting a lot of diverse information. So this is just sort of a scattering of it. So our question is, how do we analyze this? How do we make judgments about the importance of a suite of information like this for a particular week in the fall of 2017? Next slide, please. So these are some of the examples of, of the information we're getting and, and probably scenarios that decision makers who are listening to this call may be faced with too. And you're already looking at this information and sifting the information and trying to make decisions based on what's available. So example number one is second week of October, H5N8 is being identified repeatedly in wild and domestic birds in East Asia. There's a mallard positive in Alaska. Central Alberta has a mean temperature of seven degrees and NDVI is increased because harvest is not complete, and there's surface water is within historical means, and there's been a ton of trumpeter swans gathering on the ponds this fall. Or maybe it's the third week of April, H5N3 has been identified in poultry in France. In the Fraser Valley, the mean temperature is 10 degrees, and NDVI is within historical means. Surface water is above historical means, and there's numerous reports of waterfowl and shorebirds. So when you're looking at that information, different people may come to different decisions about, how, about the threat level for that information. And the same person may make a different decision next week based on mood or whatever. So we want to develop a clear, uniform, and transparent framework to evaluate the threat of transmission of avian influenza from wild birds to domestic poultry. Next slide, please. So this is phase three of the study, and that's how to score, weight, and combine the data for a measure of threat evaluation. And we're using an additive model of an MCDA. It's called SMARTER, and I have the reference for it there. And this is the same model that the Center for Disease Control uses to evaluate viruses for their influenza risk assessment tool, or the IRAT. So thank you to the CDC for directing us in this direction. Um, so there's sort of two basic phases of it. One is the selection of the data used, which is the objective part of the decision process and has already been done. And today we're looking at the different criteria and it's more of a subjective evaluation and that requires subject matter experts, which are all of you on the phone. And so wherever you see that little clip art of four little people, that means subject matter experts and that's where I'll, we'll be asking you to fill in the poll. Next slide, please. So we had three broad categories of data, and within each category, um, we identified one or three elements. So under the detection of avian influenza virus, we have global distribution, where is it in the world? Temporal distribution, how often is it being identified? And evidence of transmission to domestic birds. Mm -hmm. Under migratory routes, we just have waterfowl present. And under environmental conditions, we have temperature and the presence of ice and snow, amount of surface water, and vegetation density. So I'm going to start by providing an overview of the model and how it's developed so you understand where we're heading. And so we're going to, so remember we're going to evaluate the potential threat of AI transmission from wild birds to domestic poultry within each category for each of the elements. And each of those elements can either be quantitatively or qualitatively measured. Next slide, please. So again, the overview. For each of the elements, there, a risk score is applied to them. And the risk score is based on a def 
definition of low, moderate, or high risk. There will be a numeric value within each of those with each of those categories, but we're looking at just the definitions for low, moderate, and high. And so those have already been provided, and, and we're just going to review them and um, get your opinion on whether they're appropriate and how you would change them if you don't think they are. So, so the risk score changes with each scenario. So for example, a virus reported on PROMED is of low, moderate, or high importance. If it's discovered in Turkey, it might be you know, it would fit in the low, and if it was discovered in Washington State, then it might be um, considered a high risk. Next slide, please. The next thing I'll be asking you to do is to rank each of the, uh, these elements in order of importance. So which one do you think is the most important and which is the least important? One Most important being one, least seven. So from the ranks, I'll be determining the weights, all of the weights sum to one. And the ranks and the weights for each of the elements do not change. So that virus that was discovered in Turkey has the same weight as the virus discovered in Washington State. It's the risk score that changes. So, um, so then you'll keep in, you have to keep that in mind when you're ranking these. That will happen later on this afternoon. Next slide, please. So from the weight that is calculated from the ranking, we multiply the risk score by the weight and come up with the sum in column F, which is sometimes termed the contribution in this literature. And the sum of all of the contributions, or the, the entire sum of column F, becomes the cumulative risk score. So for every week the data is collected, it'll, it'll be evaluated using this matrix and there'll be a single number representing the threat level for that week. Are there any questions about this before I go any farther? Have I lost you all? <laughs> Michelle, <laughs> it's Nancy DeWitt asking a question. So are you, are you asking us to give our opinion on whether we think something like environmental conditions are a risk? No. Okay. We've already determined that they are, and so we have definitions for them, and we want to see, we want your opinion on whether the definitions are appropriate. If you don't think, if you don't think it was an appropriate choice of data, we're also, we have, by all means, let us know. And, and so the definite, all of that will be coming up. Okay, thanks. Hey, Michelle, it's uh, Linda Verbova. I have a question. So um, this is for all events happening in that week. So it is if there are two reports, let's say one in Turkey and one in um, the, in Washington State. Like that's that's the thought, right? Yeah. Huh. Okay. Thanks. Uh, it's uh, Dale from Manitoba here. Um, we did the same thing, this, this process with Lyme disease, so it's an interesting process you're going through. And one of the things we found is frequently um, the discussion keeps going back to your description of your categories and elements. So for example, under environmental conditions, you have amount of surface water, but how you weight or rank those things would be different if you leave it like that or if you have it as amount of surface water like in a tighter region or something like that within so many K of an area. Um, so are, like, are you set with your elements or are you thinking about adjusting them? Um, they, they can be adjusted and as we, we, we didn't want to put a lot of time showing you the data that we're collecting. Um, we're, as we go through the definitions, you'll understand the type of data we have. Uh, and then, and then, if you have any suggestions, by all means, offer them because there's still time to change all this. Yeah, I'm just curious at where you're at, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Dale, it's Jane. I might just also add that we did have other elements that we considered, but these are the ones that um, we had sort of easily accessible data that we could get on an ongoing basis, cons sort of consistently. Um, there were other things that we did consider, but we didn't have good necessarily sources of information. Okay. I mean, what information, like for go back, going back to surface water, is that amount of surface water in Western Canada, in the Fraser Valley? It's, it's in the Fraser Valley. It's, 
It's in each of the Sentinel sites, specifically. It's in each of the sites. And, and it, we have anomaly maps, which shows it by pixel, and I don't know how big a pixel is, but it's, anyway, we have pixelated maps of the surface water, and it's an anomaly map, so it compares it to the previous, the, the average from the previous 20 years, I believe. Yep. So we have pixelated anomaly maps for the Fraser Valley and for Central Alberta. Okay, and Michelle, it's Andrea. Uh, it, is that actually available for the entire country? Uh, not in our study, but yes. Okay, yeah, no, that's what I, I was just wondering. Like, it, this is a, a pilot in those two areas, but if this was to expand, then yes. that could and be possible. Which is why we chose that type of data. So this is based satellite based data from either the Canadian Space, Space Agency or NASA. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on uh, next slide. Uh, I have a question, Maria, oh, sure. it's Maria from APAC. Uh, I'm not sure that I get what you mean uh, about the weight or what you ex expect from us for the weight. Um, maybe it'll become clear because that's coming up again. I was just providing an overview so that you sort of knew where it was going, but it's coming up again. And if you still don't understand, we'll try. I'll explain Perfect. it again. Any other questions? Hi, it's Sharon. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just going to be a, a pedantic risk assessor and make an annoying comment, but um, I, I'd suggest because it's an MCDA and not a risk assessment and you're really looking at the likelihood of transmission, um, not so much uh, the consequences, I'd recommend staying away from the term risk score. It's just a confusing term that then, you know, when you're reporting up, I find people get really confused and we're having to deal with that issue a lot lately? Yes, and um, we talked about that, but the, the methodology for this uses the term risk score, so rather than... Um, yeah, I've talked to CDC about it <laughs> too, but because I know it's a problem with IRAT as well, but anyways, um, just... Yeah, we, we, we probably should just stick to the word threat. Yeah. Okay. There's lots to do, so we'll move on. Okay, so the first task is the risk score definition. So we've already defined each risk element in terms of low, moderate, and a high risk. So we'll be asking you whether you think they're appropriate and you will have a minute or two to make any suggestions. My email will be provided at the end of the presentation, so if you want to email me with um, more detail, that would be great. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, the, the first category was detection of avian influenza and the first element was global distribution. So I just want to give a bit of background first. These are the maps of the migratory bird flyways and the flyway is the entire range of a migratory bird. The AI, we know that AI spreads more readily among birds within a flyway, but it's also possible to transmit between flyways where they overlap, such as in northern Canada. So. So in terms of evaluating uh, global distribution, the flyway in which the virus is identified is important. For us, the most relevant flyways are the Pacific and Central flyways. They go over BC and Alberta. Um, but the Mississippi and Atlantic flyways in Canada are important, as well as the uh, West Pacific and the Asian Australasian flyways, which overlap in Northern Canada as well. Next slide, please. So these are our definitions for global distribution. And they might be identified in either wild birds or domestic poultry. Low risk was found in limited areas and in migratory flyways that do not overlap with Western Canadian flyways. Moderate risk is identified in migratory flyways that overlap with Western Canadian flyways. And high risk is identified in either the Pacific flyway or the Central flyway. And as the identification gets closer to the study sites in the Fraser Valley or Central Alberta, it goes higher within that high risk category. So if you can please indicate on the poll whether you think this is an appropriate, these are appropriate definitions and what you would suggest is different. We only have a minute or two for discussion on each one because there's lots to do, but if anybody has a comment. So I've opened the poll, so if you want to provide comments there, um, are the definitions good? Um, and then 
provide suggestions to Michelle. And, and for those of you that are um, more verbal than kinesthetic, feel free to speak up as well. Uh, it's Maria from MAPAC. Uh, it was not clear for me that the 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 evaluate the risk evaluated is uh, from a uh, West perspective. Is from the West perspective? It's it's yeah. related to the study site. Okay, perfect. So if it's a site in Quebec, the high risk will be, uh, the definition of the high risk will be changing. So it yes. will be identifying the Atlantic uh, flyway? Yes. Yes. Okay. This, is just, this is just for our study site at this time, though, Fraser Valley okay. and Central Alberta. Oh, perfect. Can, can I just ask while you're filling out the poll, is there anyone on the line that is not on the WebEx and can't see the poll? Because we can send you the questions afterwards as well. No one. Cool. <laughs> we'll go to the next slide, please, Andrea. Okay, I'm just gonna, just so see what happens when we actually, could, did you guys get the poll results? Show up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very well. Okay, so okay. next slide. Okay, so also under detection of the virus is temporal distribution. <clears throat> so this is important because the number of times a strain of avian influenza is identified within a specified time period, it can indicate its abundance as well as its ability to adapt to the host. Adapt to the host. So the low threat level, I'm going to change my wording if I can remember, is um, isolation of avian influenza strain in a time limited or sporadic, or sporadic in time. Moderate is repeated detections throughout a migratory season, kind of weeks to months. And high is repeated detections of avian influenza strain persisting into the next migratory season, so months to years. So if you can answer the, the WebEx poll, are these uh, definitions appropriate, and what changes would you suggest? Michelle, it's Andrea. While, while people are answering the poll, mm -hmm. will there be um, definitions of what time-limited or sporadic actually means? Will you be sort of breaking this? It's a, a bit vague because I kind of will need to use the data itself to refine that as I go along, I think. Yeah. Bella, did you want to uh, make a comment? Yeah, can, can, can you hear me? I, I could see, um, yeah, I can hear you, absolutely. Okay, all right, so, uh, hi, Michelle. This is Salah uh, from University Gulf. So it's hi. often a set, of, a set of combinations. Let's say you have a action within the migratory flyway, you have the birds, and you have uh, influenza virus is popping up in some places. So when you try to categorize the risk, so should we not have a uh, combination of events that 
need to occur to say, okay, this place is at than just discrete event? Uh, so you mean a combination beyond the matrix? So, because the matrix does try to accommodate, accommodate, and if there's more than one event going on in a week, they'll, they'll all be evaluated in, in the matrix. Okay. Yeah, maybe uh, we need to see more of your model and then discuss later. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully it will become clear. Hopefully it becomes clear to yes. me as we do it as well. It's not, I'm not entirely sure how, how, how fitting this all into place is going to work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. Um, so if we can go to the next Slide, please, Andrea. So the next um, element is transmission from wild birds to domestic birds or other animal species. So, and the thinking behind this element is that evidence of transmission of avian influenza into domestic birds or other species is a measure of the threat to domestic poultry, but it can also be indicative of the pathogen's distribution and ability to, to adapt to its host and disperse in the environment. So low is it's only been found in wild birds and there's been no evidence of transmission. Moderate, it's been identified in domestic poultry. High, it's been identified in domestic poultry or other animal species. And there's evidence of sustained transmission within and between domestic poultry and wild bird populations. Are these definitions appropriate and what changes would you suggest? Hi, Michelle, just a clarification. Do you mean it has not been identified as transmitted anywhere, right? Not just in your study area? Yes, just that's right, anywhere. In general. Any yeah. identified virus, so whether it's in, in Turkey or Washington State. So it's, it has H7 and 9 been, H, yeah, yeah, yeah H, exactly, H, okay. Yeah, H5, H5 or H7, is it, able to, is it able to move between species? Got it, thanks. Just a note on the poll. If the poll is staying up after it, should, it appears that it should have been closed, each of you on the phone should be able to close the poll yourself with a little X. Barry, this is my first time using the polling tool, so. <laughs> no, I think, it's going, I think it's going well, Andrea. I just thought people would like to move it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Andrea, can you tell when everybody's answered if we have time, if we can move on sooner? Yeah, it, I have a little screen here that says where people haven't started or in progress or they're finished. Okay. And, and so there's still folks in progress. Okay. So once this, they stop, we can stop the pool. So we still have um, one person in progress of completing the poll. I gave us a little bit more time uh, on this one because it seemed a little bit rushed, but uh, maybe we'll go back to two minutes for the, the next one. Okay. to the next slide? Yeah, it'll just be one second for the poll. Oh, for the sum? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. There you go. So the second 
second category was waterfowl migratory routes, and this is the element, waterfowl presence. Um, we're concerned with the ducks, geese, swans, the Enceriformes order, and shorebirds, terns, and gulls, the Chiratiformes orders. And it's focused on where the waterfowl reservoir is, not whether they're um, avian influenza positive or not, just where are they. So the low risk is outside the migratory seasons, and that's for British Columbia and Alberta, which have slightly different time frames. And so the only birds that are present are the year-round residents only. The moderate is spring migration, with increase, increasing numbers of birds um, in the Western Canadian flyways and at the study sites. And the, and the high risk, high threat, oof, that's hard to do, um, is in the fall migration with increasing numbers of waterfowl in the flyways and the study sites. Fall has been ranked as a higher threat than moderate because of the presence of immatures, uh, which are more susceptible to the disease uh, and, and are good hosts for the virus. So that's why fall is considered a higher threat than spring. So are these definitions appropriate? And what, what do you have any suggestions for improving them? Uh, it's Al Dam from Momafra from Ontario here. Uh, just a question. Uh, in Ontario, every once in a while, Toronto will move birds, like uh, some of these target species, out of the city to, like, out of the city. Where would that uh, fall in this? Would that fall under low, you think, or would that be, because it happens in the spring, would that be moderate? Uh, that would probably be moderate. Except if you're the farmer who has the birds beside you. <laughs> <laughs> then you're not happy about it. <laughs> How much are you going to be able to differentiate, Michelle, between the actual species? Because I'm thinking the risk is probably different based on the species. Um, amongst these birds, I'm not going to just try. I, because there's different, the, the literature isn't clear. Um, you know, sometimes the green-winged teal shows up as being super important, and others say the shorebirds are super important. So, um, and lots of times on eBird, the, they're defined just as a duck. Okay. So, some birders are better than others. Andrea. Okay, you ready for the next one? Yeah, next slide. So we're into the environmental conditions category, and the first one is temperature and consequently the presence of ice and snow. <clears throat> so this is being considered because open water is preferable to waterfowl, and uh, they prefer it a bit cooler, as well as cooler temperatures improve the virus survival. So there's a thermometer there also to help visualize these temperatures. So low is warm, very warm, or very cold. And if it's very cold, the water bodies are frozen. Moderate is between 10 and 15 degrees centigrade, or minus 5 to minus 10. And some of the water bodies are still open. High risk is the peak time for virus survival. Um, and, and ducks and geese are happy to stick around. So it's minus 5 to 10, and the water bodies are open. Are these definitions appropriate, and what suggestions could you make? Michelle, visually there's a, a big difference in your moderate categories because on the low side, the water bodies will be frozen. Uh, for sure, some of them, would, the smaller ones will be frozen. Some of the some of the uh, bigger ones may still be open a bit or where there's a bit of running water. And yeah. there is, yeah, I mean, if, I almost wanted to make four categories here, but I didn't want to change my plan. So if you, if you have a suggestion for changing those temperatures, by all means. Okay, thanks. Just 
just as a note on that one too, like, so Michelle explained earlier that these are our general broad categories, low, moderate, and high, but within each of those, it could be a low moderate versus a high moderate, and that might be where, you know, the temperature is within that range in the moderate score, but maybe all of the water bodies are frozen. And so maybe that changes the risk to a lower one, but still within the moderate category. And we're not, we're not asking you today about the specific numerical values, just whether these general broad categories are correct. That helps a lot, thanks. Okay. It's the next step, right? Right, is there gonna be a possibility for another discussion Yes. Oh. yes, actually that comes up later. There, um, we're going to need another discussion in January and at that point we'll have the data, uh, the data will have been run through the, the matrix um, and so, so we, can look at, we can look at some of the decisions we made and, 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 how, they, and how we ended up with a cumulative sum for each of the decisions. So yes, we're hoping to do that in January. Great. Um, it's Nancy here. I was still typing and it says the poll has ended. Uh-oh. Nancy, I think you can still submit. Uh, no, it's grayed out now. It's Oh. It's yeah, that okay. happened to me too before. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'll be provided. If you can just make a note of that and I have my email at the end of the presentation and then you can forward it to me after. Uh, sure. You might have to maybe send out the questions again, because I, by the time we get to the end of the presentation, I won't remember what the question was. Yeah. Um, the, the presentation is, is available on the CZ website, and uh, the questions are always the same. So, and I think actually we, we did have the questions and the, and the definitions on a separate Word document as well, right, Andrea? Yes, we do. I think the other thing too is do we need, if people are getting cut off, do we need to lengthen the time a little bit? On each um, we, we probably, we might not get to the end, okay. but we're getting close anyway. Okay. So mm -hmm. Maybe let's add another 15 seconds. Okay. <laughs> I think maybe the problem is I'm writing too much. We, we want all feedback, that's great, Nancy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not no, giving we're not complaining about that. I was leaving it at that, I'm giving you comments and <laughs> <laughs> I'm overthinking it. <laughs> okay, so the next um, element in, under the category environmental conditions is the amount of surface water. And the reasoning for this is wetlands are preferred waterfowl habitat. So if there's abundance of this habitat, they're more likely to linger before they head further south or north in the winter, in, um, in the spring I mean. And the wetlands also improve avian influenza virus survival. So we are measuring surface water by using anomaly maps, and we're comparing the cumulative soil moisture to historical averages. So, so we have, and I, I don't have a picture of it with me, but the, so it's a map with pixels showing how, how, how the soil moisture in one pixel of the Fraser Valley differs from the 20-year average. And there's, within the Fraser Valley, there's probably about 40 zones um, is, is and, and we'll have to try to summarize that in, in some way. So, so low is drier than historical averages, moderate is within historical averages, and high is more surface water than historical averages.
So the last element for environmental conditions is vegetation density, again measured uh, using uh, normalized density vegetation index from remote sensing and satellites. So if asking the question, how green is it? So do the birds have something to eat? Again, it's an anomaly map, so it's comparing it to, to the previous historical averages. So low is below historical averages, so that would suggest either very dry conditions or perhaps an early snow. Moderate is within historical averages, and high is above historical averages. So that may be um, delayed harvest in the prairies or um, unseasonably warm and wet conditions allowing for an early spring or a late fall. So are these definitions appropriate? Hi, Michelle. Just wondering, how correlated is this particular one, the vegetation density, to the previous one, to the amount of water? Um, yeah, we don't, it's best if, if the elements aren't redundant. You shouldn't have any redundancy between the elements. And I, and I tossed about whether I should just combine them or not, and I decided not to because there's other reasons for, because there's snow and, and so, you might have high soil moisture because of wet snow, but, but low NDVI. So mm -hmm. it could go either way. I decided they were different enough. Okay. Okay, thanks. Is, is there any evidence to suggest that um, this is going the right direction? Because I, I could convince myself that if there's no vegetation, therefore little food, the birds will congregate around farms where there might be grain leakages and stuff like that and actually increasing the risk. That is a challenge and it's also a challenge for the dryness because if it's really dry there will be fewer sloughs so there will be more birds on the sloughs. They may not stay as long but there's a potential for greater transmission while they're there. Um, those are all questions that hopefully we can sort through as we go through the data and decide how important it is to tease out those details. We don't. We don't have. Right. It's not. It's not always straight. It's not all very linear. So it, it there's there's different scenarios that might make this very challenging. And it's Nancy. And this one is difficult for the Fraser Valley because it's really quite green here, typically in the winter, unless there's snow on the ground. So it's rather yeah. correlated to the environmental snow question. Yes. Yes. And, and it does capture it does capture the snow better than temperature might. Um, so, because it's kind of a combination of precipitation and and temperature, but it does matter in the prairies. Uh, it's Al again. How would we account for um, crops that might be left over winter? Like we sometimes have corn crops that don't get harvested until early spring. Would that, would that fall under the high risk? Yes, it would fall under the high. If, if okay. it's not covered with snow so that it can be picked up with remote sensing, then it would be captured. Well, we're hoping that it could be captured in the high. Okay. Next step. So that was the end of the definitions, and now we're about. We're, I'm going to ask you to rank each of the elements from one to seven, keeping in mind that the, these, from the rank, I'm going to determine the weights. And for those who are interested, um, the math for that is in the notes. So, so the ranks and the weights don't change regardless of where that, regardless of, of the details of the element. Um, it only changes if the question changes. So I have the question back up again. This is the question we're asking. And how would you rank the elements of importance from one to seven? So, Michelle, one is the most, most important. important. Seven is the least. Yes. Okay. I've given everyone a little bit more time on this just because. This could be hard. It could be very difficult to choose between them.
when people are working through this, Michelle, what kind of feedback will um, will be happening next in terms of all the folks that are participating now? And um, do do we want to communicate sort of next steps or how how things are are going to progress next? I know it's um, our yeah. So um, I have a request for participation a little bit in a minute or two, mm -hmm. and then. Um, probably beyond people that reach out to me individually, there probably won't be any feedback until January. Okay. And then I would like to present this again in, you know, where we're at it's sometime in January. Is that but I'm more than willing to um, chat with anybody who has thoughts on the best way to approach this. And I also think there would be a great opportunity, like, because we've had a large number of people on the call it might be good to have a discussion about some of the individual elements where we have expertise. So if there's an interest on your part and on the folks on the call to engage in more discussion, I'm certainly more than willing to set that up and, and to be there to make it happen um, if needed. Okay. Yeah, if, if people are interested in further discussion, if they want to let me know and then um, you and I can arrange something. Yeah, because I think there's there's so much expertise on the phone, and so many of these elements can be broken down further, and uh, and we just didn't have time within an hour, mm -hmm. and uh, it would be nice to be able to go into some of those more deeply with the with the expertise available. Um, I have a comment about uh, this uh, this exercise for the element. I just realized that I. I think that it's really difficult to rank between some of them between uh, because uh, when you you think about for example the waterfall presence uh, you have this criteria there the, that element uh, but the temperature and, and presence of snow ice the amount of surface water and the vegetation density are also some element that uh, influence the waterfall presence so it's like to uh to uh, it's it seems to double the 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 weight or the the yes the the is you're, it, you're it's absolutely right. the same um, <laughs> the challenge is getting good information on waterfall presence so i wanted to use other criteria that would support the presence of waterfowl. Birders don't tend to report the waterfowl as often as they'll report songbirds and raptors and so on. Um, so it does double up. How useful the, the information is um, will be determined at the end of the project, and, and some of and there'll be further re refinements. Then we'll you know we'll come to realize that it's too redundant and, and remove. Some are all, you know, some of these elements. If they're not, if they're just okay. repeating what we already know. Okay, so we'll get wrap this up. So to review the work that's been done today, um, and thank you very much. So we've reviewed our risk scores, and with the feedback you've provided us, um, we'll refine our definition. And then you rank the elements in terms of importance and we'll look at the distributions of your responses and try to find a general consensus among your responses. So we've done steps one and two. The third piece is deciding at what cumulative sum measure we shift the alert levels. Next slide, please, Andrea. So this is our next step. What cumulative risk score will shift our threat level from a green to a yellow or from a yellow to a red? Uh, we, we don't know what the data is going to look like, so I think we need to run with the data before we can establish those cutoffs. But like I said, I would like to meet in January um, and maybe look at what's been done and see if we can establish the cutoffs. So the, the poll question is, would you be willing to participate again in a workshop in January? And I only gave a minute for this since we're over time, and it's yes or no. <laughs> it should be quick. Okay. 
So, Michelle, are you using a cumulative um, a QSUM theory to to help you here, or I missed that previous slide? Or um, you mean for the when I when yeah. I when I rank, when I look at how you rank the elements in terms of importance? No, it's the cutoff levels. Is that oh, um, I don't know how. I haven't thought that far ahead. <laughs> So oh, okay. we'll look at how the how the cumulative risk scores are uh, how they're distributed, and and then, um, uh, yeah, would you suggest a QSUM? Well, um, I have I have experience with a QSUM, and I I know that you don't have to have a steady state for a QSUM, but I'm not sure it's the best analysis for this. It might be. Yeah. Um, I don't know yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> okay. Um, so that takes us to the last slide. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. We literally couldn't have done it without you. Um, I look forward to looking at your responses. And if you have any further questions or comments or uh, anything you want to contact me about, my email is there. And are there any more are there any comments or questions about today's workshop? Please let us know if there's more that you want to say we can host as needed. Um, and if there's other topics too that folks want to have this option on, we'll we'll make it possible. And Andrea, can I just confirm, so like for Nancy and Linda and others who may have run out of time, um, can we post the, the, the poll questions as well as with the presentation on the CAVS website? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll do it today. Okay. Nancy and, and Linda and other responses directly to me. Yeah. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. We can also, Linda and Nancy, we can send them directly to you as well, but. That would be good because I'm trying to download the uh, presentation, but it's it won't let me. I can view it, but I can't print it. It I lose all the images oh. off it. So I, oh, oh, bit. okay. That's good to know. Thanks, Nancy. Do you want me to convert it to a PDF? Oh, that'd be great. Okay, I'll convert it to a PDF and I'll send it to you, Andrea, to post. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.